a little bit. And if Kevin Warren is hired to do his job, will the Bears fire Matt Eberflus during the season? Could this be the first time in their entire existence that they actually let the president make uh, the choice and cut this thing early? Or do they write it out to the end of the year? To answer the question specifically, if Kevin Warren is to be expected to do his job as a team president, this next 10 games is going to be exactly your example of whether or not ownership can overpower a presidency of Kevin Warren. And I have a few tenants in sports that I believe in. And one of the big ones that Paulie doesn't agree with me on is that nothing really changes with your franchise until ownership changes. And I personally big time believe that until ownership changes and the people from the top to the bottom change, nothing's ever really going to change. And he gives me a lot of examples where he's right and it doesn't matter. And I can give him a lot of examples where it does matter. In this specific case, it will tell you everything. Because if Kevin Warren is hired to be team president and he was in charge of a conference in college football that rivals you know one specific team in the nfl like the big 10 is a is a multi-billion dollar conference multiple teams and colleges and scholarships and coaches and controversies this man can run one nfl team i guarantee you if his decision is to fire matt eberflus and or ryan poles by game six or game eight you need to let him do that if there's in any way shape or form a hint of McCaskey interference and Kevin Warren is not allowed to fire them, then you have a problem that will never go away until the McCaskies go away. If you're going to ride out with Matt Eberflus for one more year after this, fine, I guess, right? because we've had that discussion before, because there are positives to look towards. And the NFL is very, very sloppy right now. And I think, like I said, every single week, Moving forward, if the Bears are not huge underdogs, I don't see a world where every week I can't imagine how they beat a team. Like when we do a, a Minnesota prediction, I I very much could see how the Bears win this game. Is it likely? Probably not, because I'm going to default to the coaching staff failing, the defense failing, but it wouldn't surprise me or it wouldn't shock me. So if you are ready to make that move, and, I, and if you are ready to start going to the next coaching staff, I do not want a developmental coaching staff. That's the last thing I want at this point. I would like So no to, Ben Johnson? Probably not. I don't... I, ideally, I don't want it. I mean, there's always the one new guy per year that just blows everyone away. And it's always going to happen, and it's every single year. Right? And it's usually a guy from the Shanahan tree. It was Matt Nagy one year, by the way. It was. But even then, I would say there was a different guy that year that was probably better. You know, it was Brian Dable last year. So, it, it, you know, and it's usually not the flashy guy, but it, it's the Mike McDaniel. It's the uh, Kevin Stefanski on the Browns. You know, you don't think of the Browns as like a powerhouse, but like Browns are really, really good. And they've been working with chickens. They're making some chicken salad out of that. So... Other than the Mike Tomlins of the world, there's a lot of guys that are sneaky under the radar, good coaching staff hires, like uh, Zach Taylor in Cincinnati, right? Like, you don't talk much about Zach Taylor, but that's because he's doing his job really well. And usually head coaches that are doing their jobs well and building foundations and stuff, Dan Campbell is flashy and he's fun and he makes a lot of noise and he's big and he's strong and he gets excited and screams. But the guys I'm thinking of are like the Mike McDaniels of the world, the Zach Taylors, the Kevin Stefanskis. So you can find some stability and start building off of that. But at this point, I mean, Matt Eberflus was the safe choice, right? He was the guy to build your team around and that didn't work out either. So either way, you know, it can bite you and it can be unsuccessful. But in my ideal situation for the next coaching staff, I want somebody who's rock steady and just, I don't even think that the next head coach is the guy to get you over the hump. But I do think you need some very, very stabilizing force for like two to three years moving forward, and then you can get creative. If you are lucky enough to have another shot at a coaching hire, if you're Ryan Poles. 
See, and I and I think it can change very quickly. I think the next guy could be the guy. I, I don't see that as being unfathomable. I think you have to look at the availability of head coaches in the offseason that you could potentially hire and say, well, are we truly better off with X, Y, and Z or Matt Eberflus? Now, I know Jim Harbaugh is the name that gets brought up a lot. That's the popular one. But um, I'm going to tell you right it, now definitively. I'm going to tell you definitively, and I don't even need to hear anymore. You are definitely better off with Jim Harbaugh than Matt Eberflus. Oh, yeah. 100%. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I don't so even... that's, yeah, that, that is an upgrade in itself for sure. However, um, outside of that, I don't see many very enticing coaches being available that I would be very happy to have here. I mean, you don't know who's going to become available yet. There's still plenty of something left to play. Um, you know, there's plenty of coaches in this league that I would love to have. I would love to have a Mike Rabel. I really would. Um, I, I like Kevin O'Connell from the Vikings, too. I think he does a decent job. You mentioned Mike Tomlin. And Mike Tomlin's not going anywhere. He's a great coach, though. Um, so, yeah, there are guys out there. There are names out there. But the question is, who's going to be available? And is that truly worth hitting the reset button again this year? Or are you better off waiting another year because you might have potential better coaches available i think for the sake of the players i think for the sake of the players you need to hit a reset button as soon as possible we haven't heard anything about matt eberflus's future yet and although we don't know exactly what's going to happen and it could surprise us all there is a good chance that matt eberflus will be here so lauren i'm going to ask you what does he bring to the table that's exceptional that another coach couldn't bring and when you do think of the elite coaches in this league is there anybody that you could compare his traits and characteristics to? I think it's a great question to ask, and I and I will try and answer it. But I, I think that's a question that not a lot of not, not enough people are asking themselves. Like, the Bears defense clearly played better in the second half of this past season, and Matt Eberflus is the defensive coach. But like, if you think about like what what Matt Eberflus does on this defense, like what has his role been in this defense playing better? It's it's really hard to sit here and pinpoint like the specific thing or things that Iberflus does really, really well as a head coach or a defensive coordinator. Like he's not calling, you know, the the world's most creative coverages, right? He's not, he's not coming up with, you know, crazy disguises or just brand new ways of thinking or shifting coverages or certain calls, like adjustments off of certain coverages that guys are adjusting to. And like, you know, they're passing off routes in a certain way that is really innovative or creative. I don't know that we, I can objectively say like this is the best way to but like, this is the percentage of cover two that you should call versus the percentage of cover four like there's no way to to really like measure and pinpoint okay Eberflus is calling the right mix of coverages better than other coaches are calling the right mix of coverages so like to me the answer like to answer your question is very little like there's very little that Matt Eberflus that I can see that we can measure in any real way that Matt Eberflus does at a highly exceptional effective level that other coaches wouldn't be able to do you know I don't know if devil's advocate is the right word there. Like the thing that he does exceptionally that other coaches can't do is that he's been here for two years. You know, he knows all of these players on the roster right now better than any coach coming in from the outside would. Probably the only thing I could think of as well is at a point where we got four turnovers against the Lions and still blew that lead and lost that game. At the end of that, I said, this team's done. They're not going to try as hard for this coach again. And next week they did. So I, I give him credit for not losing the locker room during losing because, yeah, when you're winning, it's easy to hold a locker room together. But when you're losing, that's when it gets bad, and that's definitely a positive. Like that, he's got that uh, for sure. He has the faith of the locker room a lot more than if any every new coach that we brought in would have to build that faith up, and he already has some of that. And that's it's not meaningless. That's not nothing. Sure, like it's good and important that the players do like him, but it feels like any coach who wins – the players will like them. the players like to win. And I guess give him credit for holding the locker room together last year during a terrible season where there wasn't much winning and players could have easily kind of turned on the team and given up and not tried hard. And like he deserves credit for some aspects of leadership and, and locker room management. One other thing is that you look at you do look at the coverages the Bears ran this season. Uh, first four weeks of the season, right up to the Washington game, week five, and they had the mini bye week afterwards. From that point, 
drastic change in the coverage calls that they use. Like weeks one through five, when the defense is really bad, they set a lot of cover two, a lot more soft zone, not much man coverage. After week five and on, he, he definitely like, you can see in the data, like looked at what he was calling as a cover for terms of coverages as a play caller and changed it. And it was much better from that point on. And like, he deserves credit for that in terms of self scouting and not being so married to his cover two system from the past that he has to keep forcing that over and over again. He did adapt and change. And that did, I think, contribute to some degree to better defensive performance. Like Mike Tomlin, I don't know what you necessarily say is his thing and the stability. Um, John Harbaugh, for example, is much more of a, of a CEO type. He's a special teams coordinator. He doesn't call plays on either side, but it's just like a stable force. And it's a, he's a good listener. He really listens to what his players needs. He makes adjustments based on what he's, what they're good at and what they need to do. So there is something about stability and flexibility. Um, but I don't, I don't need that from a guy who also calls plays at a mediocre level and all that stuff. So like, if you are that guy, then you really better be really good at hiring offensive and defensive coordinators. You better be really good at managing and managing your actual like corporation of coaching staff. Like, I don't know how, how much involvement Matt Eberflus had with handpicking his coaching staff, but one guy was fired for reasons to be known. And the other guy is arguably a bottom five offensive coordinator. Players, it was a good call by the, by the, whoever this coordinator was. That was, that would be me. Did you, did you hear that? Well, let me just replay that really quickly. We just replaced a good call by the by the whoever this coordinator was that was that would be me so with whatever stability and play calling ability and all that that you can bring to the table if you can't manage your own staff at the micro at the macro level i don't trust that you can like go down all the way into the nitty-gritty of your team and on a mic on a uh, micro level be a good manager of like men and all that stuff they could like you all the uh, all that you want like i do like that uh lawrence at one point like worked his way to the nicest way of saying like he's there <laughs> like, hey, <laughs> if you do keep flus you do need to add a defensive coordinator to the staff and a, a stable offensive coordinator i mean i don't think luke gets you sticking around i think the, oh, most bears fans are on the same page there that that needs to change so with that being said does anybody come to mind yeah i think defensive coordinator wise i, I look first at guys currently on the coaching staff, it seems like Iberflus having just been the defensive coordinator all year. I don't know that he's needs to go out and get a totally new outside voice. Like I, I've been asked before, like, you know, Lovey Smith as a possibility there. And I mean, I, I guess, or, I mean, there was talks of him trying to get Rod Marinelli out of retirement, but Rod kind of declined that too. Like, I don't think, I don't think either one of those is super likely, but I mean, right on the coaching staff, they've kind of made John Hoke, the cornerbacks coach. It's kind of felt like he's been the de facto veteran defensive coach that everyone talks to as though he's the defensive coordinator without having any of the defensive coordinator, you know, like pay or title or responsibilities at this point. But I mean, he's been an NFL defensive coordinator before for a few different teams, I believe. And he's certainly been a college defensive coordinator for a long time. And he, you know, he's a veteran coach. I think he would make a lot of sense in that spot. Also, if that's, the, if that's the case though, why wouldn't they have promoted him this year? That's a good, that's, that's a good question. Uh, and I I don't know why I don't know why they didn't just bother promoting someone this year. I mean, even as an interim defensive coordinator, why? why it, it seems like it would have made sense either way to put someone in that role. I know we feel pretty good about Eberflus, or at least that's the overall conception out there amongst the fan base, especially with the new haircut, the new sneakers. Like the look has changed, and I think that almost has a lot of people more excited than what they did on the field for some reason. You know, at the end of the day, we looked at a season where we got rid of our defensive coordinator in week two for whatever reasons. Um, we knew we should have fired our offensive coordinator by week eight, but you can't you can't sit there and lose your offensive and defensive coordinator in one season and expect to keep your job. It just felt to me like, hey, we were so close to being able to do a complete reset, get new coaching staff in there, go get Jim Harbaugh out there or something, make him a deal he can't refuse, and get the number one overall pick and get a – like it was just so close, yet we decided to keep Eberflus. We wound up getting some prominent coordinators. Shane Waldron has some history of success in the NFL. Eric Washington has some history of success in the NFL. However, I feel like if we're 0-3 this year, I want four. You quickly start looking at Matt Eberflus. What do you think about the coaches we have coming into this year? Eberflus and the offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator. 
I I am absolutely excited about Waldron and Washington. I'm will, I'm definitely willing to give them a chance to see what they do. At no point was I ever clamoring for Eberflus to come back. I, I think he's a terrible coach. I don't, I don't I don't understand why they brought him back. Why do you fire your coordinators but keep keep the worst one out of all of them? I, I, in my own my, that's my opinion. You know, I mean, a lot of people. Uh, you know, he grew up here, so he's, you know, he's going to be a great, he's going to be a great coach now, you know, and, and for what, I, what is, I'm still waiting for somebody to tell me what he's done outside of get, getting a Indianapolis Colts team to an above average defense that he's, a, he's good enough to be a coach in the NFL because, I, because my personal opinion, and I, I, I'll take this to the, to the bank. After he is done being the coach of the Chicago Bears, he will never be a head coach anywhere ever again. I, I think the reason he's kept his job is more situational based off history rather than anything he's done. I think typically teams want to give a head coach three years. And I know we fired like Mark Trustman after two. However, that was a situation where the expectations were high and the product be, you know, the result was very low. So you looked at it as, hey, you're failing. The expectations here were very low mm-hmm. and we've improved. So it's kind of hard to sit here and fire. Like if we got three wins again this year and it matched last year, maybe then you could have made that case where like you're not getting any better, you're not doing anything. But because we won a couple more games and because he's only in year two, I think the situation kind of dictates that, hey, you just bring this guy back, but I hear you. I'm with you. I personally would have rather moved on because, in my opinion, coaching could be an issue here moving forward. I just don't understand how you could be sitting in a meeting room and you say, "Well, I, I personally think that Matt Eberflus is going to take us to the promised land." Oh, okay. So you got Jim Harbaugh out there, who obviously was available. Why the hell didn't you throw a freaking blank check at him? Is it that you're afraid to get a, a, a big name coach or a, a big name player? Are they you know? cheap? Yeah, I don't know. I'm of the believing that if I got these two guys in front of me and I say, who's better? <laughs> There's not going to be a lot of people that say, well, we should keep Matt Eve instead of going after hard after Jim Harbaugh. I would venture to say out of 100 people, 99 would say that <laughs> that guy's better. <laughs> Dude, I'll take Mike Rabel. Personally, I, I, w- I wasn't against that one either. I, I don't even know why the hell he got fired, to be honest with you. But at the end of the day, you know, again, I, I, I don't understand the thought process. Maybe it came from uh, hires and said, hey, Ryan, we're going to get we're going to get through this coach. You know, just let it play out. And then you, you could get whoever the hell you want after the third year. I, I cannot understand for the life of me how that they continue to think that a guy like this is a good coach. I, I don't either. I mean, the only highlight anything I saw about him was a little clip where he was given, where he had like nicknames for every player. Like, you, dude, you want nicknames? I'll go in there and give you nicknames. There's plenty of real coaches with history of success. Like you said, I don't know what Matt Eberflus history of success really is. You know, if you're going to replace both coordinators, I just don't understand why not replace the head coach as well. But they, they did what they did, right? Just go after a big name. What's the problem? Are we anti like paying someone? I don't get it. It's got to be it. It's got to be a financial thing. It's got to be a cheap financial thing because what other reason could there be? I don't know. I I don't know because I mean, you had a chance to go all in on Jim Harbaugh and you didn't do it. You didn't do it. You didn't do it at all. Everything I read on numerous websites, reports, granted, again, I don't know if they're true or not. They like barely even talk to the guy. <laughs> Correct. How could, you, how could you not talk to him? How, why, how do you not bring him in and say, yo, what's it going to take to be the next parasite coach? Because we'll get rid of this guy. We'll get rid of this guy right now. Oh, well, I mean, the fact that you didn't even really show interest, that's nuts. That's crazy. It's Jim Harbaugh. To me, you know, Cliff Kingsbury was available. I would have taken him as offensive coordinator, especially if you plan on drafting Caleb. Oh, you don't got you got to tell me, Cliff. Everybody knows I'm a, I'm a massive fan of Cliff. Cliff are you okay as a cool. coordinator, as a coordinator, not as head coach? Correct, because he's shown competence and success. And the um, ideology there was, well, 
what if you don't do well you're going to bring in like okay the way Eberflus would lose his job would be if the defense starts giving up fourth quarter leads again and this and that and if the offense is clicking you have King, uh, Cliff Kingsbury there you're going to bring in a guy that could potentially take your job in the future and I'm like yeah yeah why not like for you to be afraid of your coach taking your job means you suck to begin with. Like you shouldn't be afraid. You should want to put the best staff together for the talent you have and hope to succeed with it all and not sit there and make decisions based off of your job security. And it just seems silly to me. I would have loved uh, Cliff Kingsbury to be here, especially if we're going to draft Caleb. I was really, man, I, there, there was one report where I read the bears are talking to him or I don't know if they interviewed him or whatever it was, but you know, I was like, man, that would be so awesome. Like Texas, Oklahoma, USC, Alabama mentality. You know what I mean? You just got to have like some of those guys sometimes, you know. If the guy would have came here and if you would have hired somebody and you hired Cliff uh, Kingsbury and he gets the offense to score 28, 25 points a game or something like that, I mean, how, how could you complain about that, you know? A little good, I guess, out first because there's always, you know, there's always both sides. I thought – Caleb starting seven for seven was a positive. Although his first incompletion came on a third down, still seven for seven is better than what we saw in week one. Uh, those those jitters, I thought, kind of went away. Passes were a little bit more on target. Just to speak to that, even if he has a shaky game right now, he's probably still the best quarterback I've seen in 25 years. Well, of course, and I mean, that's why I said I'm going over good things. The Bears put themselves – in a position at the end of the game where you're down six points and you have a minute and a half. If that's Aaron Rodgers, that's an opportunity to win the game. If that's Patrick Mahomes. It's an opportunity to win the game. If that's any of these top-tier quarterbacks. A minute and a half and you're down six, and you need a touchdown drive, you can go win that game. Um, you don't usually put a quarterback in that position in his second game in the NFL. However, we did wind up in that position. Caleb did not come through. And so it's like, you know, that's going to be one of those things, in my opinion, that he's going to have to check off the list at some point. The sooner the better. I don't expect him to do it. However, at least the team put him in position to win. Now, we kept saying it. This is not about the statistical record this year for us. It's not. At no point did I really expect to win this game last night. I didn't. So I'm not upset by any means that we came away with a loss. What I am upset about is that you got your rookie quarterback sacked seven times. What I am upset about is that you're running Nate Davis out there still. Oh, here's the other positive. You didn't let Vilas Jones Jr. touch the ball. Okay, so maybe you learned a little bit of something, right? Just, just a little bit of something. But my God. Goodness. Even with that, though, don't you feel like they probably wanted to give Valus the Jones, Valus Jones the ball a little bit? He might like, you know they wanted us, to like, just a little bit. He might just save us if he takes this kick return and he takes mm -hmm. it back house. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Dude. So here's the thing. To all the people out there, and, and we've been very respectful, very mild. We've been the guys to sit here and tell you, hey, we're just two guys with an opinion. We're not pretending we're trying to be smarter than everybody else. We're not pretending we're trying to be smarter than the guys at Hell's Hall. But, man, with just two guys with an opinion, it seems so obvious to us where it just it, – it can't – it's not that difficult. It really isn't. I opened up a show a couple weeks ago. First line was, fuck Nate Davis. What do you think was going to happen? You think, think uh, like I said, if he plays on a, a Pro Bowl level this year, I'll eat my words and I'll give him the benefit of the doubt moving forward, right? But the guy didn't practice. Of course, he's going to run out there and suck. And then you have players like Tevin Jenkins saying, well, at the end of the day, the calls come in and we execute them. And some stuff's just beyond us. To, to build on that real quick. He's the third player in the last day to say the exact same thing. Okay. If you haven't seen that, it's, well, we're running the plays that are called for us. Maybe this is – I feel like they're almost carrying over their frustrations with Luke Getze into, <laughs> into this new scheme. But 
there was a lot more leash on Luke Getze from the players even. This is the benefit of having a young team. And you can rah ride a little bit. Um, but this is their second co- offensive coach, their second defensive coordinator. This is their what should have been their second head coach. They're, you know, these are not these are guys that are going from young 22 year olds, and the majority of your team is 22 and 23 year olds, to now it's you know, Jalen Jalen uh, Johnson is a, a pro bowler and this and that. You're talking to grown men who are accountable and get called out. And the last thing you want to do is piss them off with no accountability on yourself. And this goes back to Justin Fields. The guy accidentally slipped up and made his head and his offensive coordinator accountable. And he had to retract that statement. So, you know, you know, Thai, it just takes you back to Justin Fields' first start where he got sacked nine times. This is Caleb Williams' second start. He's getting sacked seven times. I mean, two really bad challenges, not, not according to Eberflus. According to Eberflus, I don't know if you guys heard this. I mean, I put together a video on these press conferences. I'll come out with the Eberflus one after this show, and I'll, sh- I'll let you guys hear it for yourself. He said, since I've gotten here, we've been really good at that. You're two for seven. You're 0 and 2 last night. How do you clean that up to make sure that those challenges go in the right direction for you? Yeah, I mean, we've been pretty clean overall, you know, since we've been here. No, you're not really good at challenges. And those are two obvious challenges. Now, the second one, I understand a little bit more more due due to the fact that the situation could have turned that game around. But at the same time, it's your second challenge then. You can't sit there and just waste it on something that's obvious just because it's a situation. Like, no, if you had two in your pocket and you wanted to throw one on the Kyler Gordon thing, fine. I get it. But you can't make that your last one. Gone on different shows, and and I've heard all these different predictions. 11 wins, 12 wins. No, it's just, you know, I bit my lip this time. Last year I was saying, no, you guys are crazy. Because last year some people were even predicting them at 11 wins, and it's just it wasn't happening. This year, I guess, maybe. But a 12-win team's a powerhouse, like a powerhouse. David, we both had them at 9 and 8. At best, 10 and 7. But 9 and 8? I'm now looking at the product on the field, struggling to feel comfortable about predicting nine wins. We're not going to be the guys that are homers. Look, guys, look at our next three opponents. We could easily be four and one. Are you kidding me? You are penciling in victories with this team now? You. When's the last time you ever flew one three games in a row? We're going to be four and one all of a sudden? Guys. You're like, get real. This is not a good football team. It's not a, a well-coached football team by any means. We got a number one overall draft pick, and I said it with Justin Fields. I'm going to say it with Caleb Williams. This looks like the way to destroy a quarterback, not the way to develop a quarterback. And, you know, I, I went on different shows, and people were predicting, you know, 4,000, 5,000 yards was even thrown out there once at me. I was just like, you've mm. got to be kidding. Well, why? He's generational. Well, if we're if he's the number one overall pick, then we should expect that out of him. No, there's still quarterback development that needs to take place. This kid's a 22-year-old kid. He's a rookie. He's a great prospect. He's a great talent. You could still – man, I wouldn't wish for five athletes like that to jump and beat the shit out of my worst enemy every week. You know what I mean? Like you're putting this kid in there to go die. <laughs> like, man, I'll tell you, it, I said this to somebody too. If this goes south and he's like, go south. Oh, it, it can't go south. No, this is going to work. This is going to work for sure. Nothing's handed to you on a damn silver platter in this league. You got to earn it all. We've mentioned how our, our concern was with the coaching. I'm no longer concerned. I'm, I'm fucking piss man and listen there's going to be some wins along the way i'm going to have to retract that a little bit just like i had to last year because we put together a good end of the season and then i'm going to sit there and go oh well you know i'm going to start making excuses oh well of course it doesn't make sense to get rid of a guy after just two years he had a hot end to the year does he deserve to get fired this and that but the whole time we're sitting there just trying to make excuses meanwhile we had to replace an offensive coordinator we had to replace a defensive coordinator i've asked people who's the worst coach staff in this division it's us it's easily us and to sit there and have to like think about it means you're just trying to fool yourself (laughs) you're trying to fool yourself i wish they would have just pulled the plug all at once gotten the new quarterback 
I know people aren't high on Jim Harbaugh or, or people have mixed feelings. Some people are, some people aren't. Guess what? His team's rushed for 400 yards in two games. Guess guess what he would have made sure to do? He would have made sure that the, he had an offensive line there to protect Caleb Williams. We talked about how in the draft, clearly the holes were offensive line, defensive line, specifically center, guard. And we go after a wide receiver three and a punter. I'm not hating on the punter, man. And I'm not trying to hate on Odunze. From a team building perspective, though, you have holes. You could have dropped back, gotten a defensive lineman, and gotten a center. And then you're not sitting here starting these. This is the worst part. We did it exactly. I'm sorry, David. I'm rambling. I'm going on. And no, I love it. I, I need dude, to match your energy when you're done. Dude, we did this with Lucas Patrick. We went out and got Luke Getzey, and we went out and got Lucas Patrick. Why? Because he's familiar with the system. It's such placating bullshit. We're not going to beat you physically. We're going to beat you with the system, man. Because we're smarter than everybody. That's right. And what do we do this time? We went out. Listen, I thought Coleman Shelton was going to be like the just in case backup. <laughs> and you're starting. And he's getting guy. his fucking ass pounded in oh two my weeks. Oh god, dude. So, um, I'll tell you what. Offensive line problems, not easy to fix. Does Impossible to fix. Change? Mid-season, man. Week three, you don't fix those. It's going to be so such a rough season, and I think because. You know, the fan expectation for the wins for a playoff push or something is, is all there. Oh, man, get ready for this roller coaster ride because I have a feeling we're going to be sitting there at the end of the year scratching our heads wondering why did we not even interview Jim Harbaugh? And I don't know if you guys saw it. It's disgusting. Matt Eberflus, there's a list of things that he did not take accountability for today and frankly doubled down. And today, Tyreek just absolutely, not only did he not hold accountability, he almost doubled down. He's like, I wasn't talking shit to the Washington fans. I was cheering with some Bears fans. He goes, yeah, it's my job to box out Noah Gray on that play, which he's the guy who initially made that touchdown. And I, I saw on online today the prototypical Hail Mary defense of an NFL team. It was the exact play out of a playbook. And it's the bunch man, the jumper, the front man knocked down for the tip, the back man knocked down for the tip. If you notice, there's no knockdown back man because it's Tyreek. And Tyreek goes like, Hey man, you know, I made a play for the ball and you know, if ever, if I made it, if I knocked it down, everybody would be saying, Hey, great play today, Tyreek. But you know, it didn't go that way. And so, you know, it's, what happens today is what happens today. So he's basically wow. saying like, it was a 50, 50 chance. No motherfucker. You didn't do your fucking job and no one's going to hold you accountable to it because that's not what anybody does on this team. No one holds anyone accountable. Mind you, the head coach himself won't hold himself accountable, won't hold his his uh, coaching staff accountable. He won't play call any players accountable. So, of course, that's the stench. That's the attitude. We talk about arrogance, Paulie, about that weird arrogance that somehow this team feels like it's earned, that Matt Eberflus feels like he's earned. I don't know where he gets this from because he hasn't earned any of it. He's 13 and 27 as a head coach. Way too many games, by the way. That list is an insane Total of games you're allowed to coach when your record is that fucking shitty. It, it's too big of a number. And then on top of it, he's not going to say anything because what can he say? He didn't call the timeout. Flus continues to put out choke culture. Guys, 2023 versus Denver, we had a 98% chance in the fourth quarter to win. We lost. 2023 against Detroit, we had a 98 98- percent chance to win in the fourth quarter we lost 2023 against cleveland we had a 91 percent chance in the fourth quarter to win we lost and here we go 2024 against washington we had a 96 and a half percent chance to win and we lost and we talked about repeating mistakes i talked about my concern um for losing games in a certain fashion if you repeat the same things you did in the past that's not good. And then another comment he said is this isn't the NCAA. You can't bench him for that. Black Bear, uh, I've seen Bill Belichick bench guys for getting a flag. Black Bear, we've literally seen a team in our own division suspend two players in the last two years that are stars for just being a disrespectful teammate, conduct detrimental to their team. That's how you become a fucking powerhouse. That's how the Packers bench Jair Alexander, the star of their defense. That's how they bench Romeo Dobbs for a healthy scratch for having fucking attitude problems. Guess what it did for Romeo Dobbs? 
He's exactly. fucking playing. Why can't the Bears do it? Vernon <laughs> Davis. Can't win with him. You can't win with him. Remember Mike Singletary? Calling oh, yeah. out Vernon Davis? I don't want this guy on my team. What happened? It shaped him up, man. It shaped him up. Something clicked in his head. We're like, damn, I'm going to be held accountable for my actions. This Tyreek is how you Stevenson, actually establish a culture. My opinion, um, Matt Eberflus not taking accountability and essentially calling out the players and saying it was their fault for the loss. I don't like that, but it, it unfortunately is the truth. So if he doesn't handle the Tyreek situation with have either benching him, saying even if he says you're going to play 50% of the snaps, you're going to rotate Terrell Smith in more. I think I'd be okay with that, but if he just turns a blind eye, it's the same thing. Tyreek plays whatever percentage of snaps he plays. That's going to really change my mind on Matt Eberflus really, really quickly. What we're saying is the reason he needs to be fired is because he won't bench him, which he should do, because he doesn't have the job security. He doesn't have the confidence. He doesn't have the balls or the schematic confidence to do whatever he needs to do to send a message to some fucking players these are players that had a team only meeting or a team meeting with their coaches saying we want to be coached hard this year this is not coaching hard when you let him do this shit you don't call timeouts you let a 15 yard play on on uh on a play before a hail mary that's not coaching hard and then you take no accountability and then you don't bench the guys who fucked it up because you also fucked it up that's that's the definition of why these players are saying we want to be Coach Hart. And why this is why I say this game losing is almost a positive. It puts such an obvious stink in the room that you cannot keep him around next year, regardless of how the season ends, because you're your ceiling. The floor with Matt Eberflus is probably pretty high because he's a good defensive coordinator. But your ceiling is almost you're keeping it right at the same level. Their floor with Matt Eberflus is six wins. Their ceiling is nine. Can you guys see that better? Mm hmm. So I just want to, for the sake of consistency, say, I mean, October 2nd, 2023, Eberflus deserves to be fired. November 24th, 2023, do the Bears fire Matt Eberflus? Now, it's a little out of order. I think this is our most recent one. Eberflus lacks accountability. What makes Matt Eberflus special? Our answer was, we don't know. Do you trust Matt Eberflus to put together a staff? Is keeping Matt Eberflus a mistake? So, guys, this isn't something that... We're just pulling out of our ass here. This is something we've been on for a good good little while that, man, there's a clear upgrade here. And it and the coaching staff, it's so, like David said, arrogant this offseason to not even interview other guys. As if you have this all figured out, you just replace, had to replace your offensive and defensive coordinators. But everything's fine. I even put out a uh, poll on our YouTube channel saying who's got the worst coaching staff in the NFC North. Just to make people realize, oh, the thigh, and I love it. You're shaking your head no. It, it's such it's an us. obvious answer. It's, it's a us. very obvious us. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah oh, no, sure. I heard a great comment yesterday. The Bears have probably the sixth best head coach in the NFC North. Because Brian Flores, Ben Johnson – are also in this in this division. I don't know. The the one thing that, you know, you guys just said what's special about Matt Eberflus, <clears throat> I don't know how many 4-3 schemes there are, especially the way that the Bears run. So I would be very scared of the Bears blowing up their fantastic, you know, downright legendary defense because they want to fire the head coach. Not saying know. he's a bad defensive coordinator, but as a head coach, you just have way too much on your plate and, and you're not getting the job done at the end of the day. And then, Carl, you know, I know initially we had some back and forth right after the game on Twitter. And, you know, right away I told you I'm blaming the head coach because he's the head coach and it is three years in. Like, it, it's time for this to fall on the top domino here, right? And, you know, I just I, I want to say, like, let's not pretend like there isn't another coach out there that can get the same production out of the talent that's on the field. Like I always credit and blame the players a lot more than I, I do the coaching staff. Like I think the, a lot of what we're seeing from the defense is because we have good talented players. You went out there and got TJ Edwards, who you knew was a good linebacker. You went out there and got Tremaine Edmonds, Tremaine, mm -hmm. thank you. Tremaine Edmonds, who, you know, who is a good linebacker. You went out there and got Montez sweat, but what did this defense look like before Montez sweat was Eber Flus, this master defensive Coach, before that, and no, this is it, where to Carl's really point, good. To he kind was of really good go with Indianapolis and the players who they, they gained confidence and experience. I think that the young players played better. Jaquan Brisker, Kyler Gordon, they got better just with experience. 
So I don't know. I do agree with your point, but I do think that Eberflus's defense shouldn't just be thrown to the wayside. I think it is a very valuable asset, and the Bears need to figure out how to overcome the rest of it. Carl, but we're I think throwing it to the wayside right now. What you do you mean? It to the wayside. You're wasting a year with it because he's uh, the one coaching this team. Right. You're wasting a year so, of golden opportunity of this amazing defense because you are putting a cap, a ceiling on what the team can do this year because you left Matt Eberflus in charge of it. And it while feels I, more like the Bears are going through their rookie quarterback growing pains, and I think unfortunately it's something that was to be expected. And that's and I, it is a bit of a yeah t- double sided coin, double uh, double edged thing. Four three defenses are not. They're not three, four schemes with five linebackers, some crazy schematic thing where guys drop in and out of coverage. This is a, this is not an un, impossible defense to figure out. And when you ask like how many defenses and good teams are running this, this kind of defense, it's all the good ones. All the good ones can do this consistently. When you have that talent, the Eagles run the similar sets, Detroit runs similar set, Buffalo runs similar sets, uh, not Kansas City necessarily, but because they just shift their lines yeah. so much. But that's Kansas, this isn't Kansas like you City can't the not Vikings find the ones this. That I like their schemes the most. They have the six on the line. You know, essentially they're saying "fuck you" when they're playing defense, and that's what I like. But Green Bay runs it. That's but that's because you have when you the two teams you just described have two of the greatest defensive coordinators in the game, and they're guys that de- constantly, consistently decline head coaching jobs because they're happy with being the second or first paid, highest paid defensive coordinator in the league. This coaching cycle is significantly better than last year's. And that's really the one positive that you could say to holding on to Eberflus is you're going to not miss out. We were on the boat of let's let's be one step ahead here. Let's not waste another year. Let's not have a lame duck year. Let's like this is obviously going to create a wall for the success you're going to have as a team here. Um, Let's just do it now. Like I was so adamant about. Man, let's let's not be on this merry-go-round that we've been on, where we draft a quarterback and one year later fire the coach. Let's do it all in one shot. Like I would have loved to have done it all this last offseason. Yeah, draft Caleb, like- get a new coach, get a new. I mean, that's. I think that would have been a lot more beneficial for this team. Um, but then they started hot. You know what I mean? So so it's like okay, so you back off that a little bit, but here we are they're just showing who they are again and and i think the biggest key for me this week is that you had two weeks to prepare and it felt exactly like the titans game like we already got our lucky win this year and it was in week one right and you had all off season to prepare for week one and here we go you have two weeks to prepare for this and you come out looking like that like it's not going to change i have my Worst seven decisions from that one game. And I power ranked them based on what I would feel like you would be fair to saying these are Eberflus, then not so much his fault. Number one, biggest problem he did all game. Um, by far, I think the play before didn't matter. That comment, that insane, you, insane you, you comment. Can- you can call it the final minute. I don't know if that's where you're going, but both both things. He doubled down today and he said, "Look, so the, the no, play there's two didn't parts matter. to that. It did. There's two. There's there's yes, but there are such huge egregious problems. When you say the final minute, it doesn't do justice how many how many catastrophic mistakes that should have been stopped. Number one is uh, by far more than the hail mary because hail marys are just fucking bullshit luck and whatever." Not the play before not mattering. Jaden Daniels with a broken rib is not capable of throwing an 85 yard pass. So for you to be such a fucking dumbass, it's so dumb to say that the 15 yards you gave him to actually complete the Hail Mary did not matter is one of the most insane. It's one of the worst. And I saw it's so funny because I was so mad about it before. And then you see ESPN going like it's one of the dumbest things that's ever been said about pro sports ever. Mike Greenberg said this is makes his list of top dumbest things a coach has ever said. I think he said anybody in humanity. Rex Ryan went off, went off for like nine, ten minutes on just talking about. That's his job description, but go on. Yes, but just talking about, you know, and I'm not saying that Rex is the best ever, but like he went off on just the execution uh, and the game plan for that Hail Mary. Like, you have T.J. Edwards out there spying him. 
You didn't call a timeout. You do not need a spy you, on a Hail Mary. No. You do not need a it spy. It doesn't make any fucking sense. No. Was he going to scramble for 65 yards with a broken rib? The Lions please, gave please let him the try. Play. The play before didn't matter. Polly, you said it to me too, and I missed it in the moment. Caleb Williams have to, having to pull Matt Eberflus off the field to not was get Was that on the Hail uh, Mary or the play before? The play, play before. before. Play before. Oh, it wasn't Matt the Hail Mary? Caleb walked Williams onto the field. The camera zoomed in on, on, on Caleb Williams as he was on the bench, and he, like, looked sideways. It's like, oh. And then, like, we're going to get a penalty. And you see Caleb Williams run out there, grab Matt Eberflus, and drag him onto the sideline. So the, situ the, the, the Hail situational Mary. awareness no, the of your before. rookie quarterback is right. better than your head coach. Within that play. Eberflus not seeing Tyreek Stevenson and failing to call a timeout. Why don't you just call a timeout regardless? So number two. Let them line two, up and then just get a better pick and take a timeout. timeout. Number yeah, two is not calling so a timeout. Bad. It's so bad. It's so much more egregious. Even if everybody was set. And you just didn't like a little bit of something. And you then, can no, still call a timeout the same way on a fucking field goal. Yeah, just, just to get, get a snapshot. snapshot. Same way. And then yeah. let's reset. We see what they're going to do. We see where they're going to line up. They can't change it. It's a Hail Mary. There's no miss. Okay. On, two, on like, a, I, the third, two guys we had out there, personnel change. On a third down, there was a play that was questionable that was caught. And I know, Thai, you said that, like, oh, that probably would have been complete. Whatever. It was questionable. What did the commanders do? Don't be Rush. sorry for that. Don't rush up to the line, rush up to the line, try and get the snap off so it can't even be challenged because even they knew, oh, crap. It, it 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 might be, it might not be. It's one of those things. So situationally. But then he gets the challenge wrong because well, listen, they, they called but, it a catch. He'd get but, it wrong, but, and then you lose the timeout, and then you But look at the end result. That. You kept all your timeouts. You finished the game with all your timeouts. Good job. So like, you might have that, needed them. There, there was a I point. Think, well, I, I Matt Eberflus said in his that, press conference he thought if you, you keep stop, all three, you get an extra one next week. What's <laughs> no? That's yeah, what Matt Eberflus maybe thinks. Like, yeah, it's it's very possible. Yeah, the challenges stack like like my T-Mobile minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Number three, which again, this is why we're talking about one minute here. You're saying, Carl, like you almost were like the last minute was really bad. Look how much we can break down personnel on the hail mary. Can't blame it. Zach Ertz. Zach, what? Yes, you Montez can. Montez Sweat has been playing through injury. Him not being it's on the, the field. It's the Buddy, it's game. the last play of the game. You NFL. just fucking, you ice your shit afterwards. I don't well, care. Break a you leg. Only brought, you only brought three and had a spy. So Montez Sweat or anyone else is not getting through. Do you know team. who the other pass fine. rusher was on that play, Carl? It was Jacob Martin and um, Austin Booker. And then whoever Why was the playing knows and TJ no, Edwards. No Austin Booker. I thought he was. I, I must. It be was wrong. Jacob Martin, Demarcus Walker, and Jervon Dexter. That's right. the case, Black Bear. Then fine, respectfully fine. fine. However, even then, you need Austin Booker out there, your fastest defensive end, Austin to catch Booker, up to Jaden Daniels. Just his motor alone. Whether he had one arm, one on leg, a hail he mary, should have been on the field. Austin Booker needs to be out there. Yeah, and um, Darrell Taylor needs to be out there. The two highest motor quickest defensive ends you can throw out there on a Hail Mary to rush the throw. And this is just common fucking sense. And then you have zero, zero players above the height of six feet tall on that jump ball. At that point, honest to God, and I'm not even kidding this as, as like a, a cutesy thing, I have no issue if Roma Dunze or Cole Komet being 6'5 and 6'3 respectfully are out there on that play. Cole Komet, I don't know about that. Roma Dunze, I'm fine with that. Guys who can high point the ball for sure, Dave. Just yeah. that's yeah, it. Just high it. point it, slap it down, catch it, whatever. The the personnel, and I'm not exaggerating. I looked at the fucking personnel on that play. I saw five easy fixes of personnel on that. If you really have, want Demarcus Walker in there, put him in at nose. Put him in at nose. Austin Booker and Darrell Taylor need to be out there. Rome should have been out there. You're not D about Elijah to... Hicks. Elijah Hicks is five foot eleven. Tyreek Hill is six foot even. Jalen Johnson is six foot even. Zach Ertz alone is six foot six. It makes no fucking sense. The personnel choices, and that's again, Carl. I'm picking these based on these are purely and exclusively a Matt Eberflus fuck up. So number four, not challenging the catch in the second quarter. I know they rushed up to the line and snapped that ball quickly. Matt Eberflus has been absolutely mental pretzeled into throwing challenges. Where he yeah, where he's like, flag. oh, we're good on challenges, and, and it's like you're not. Yeah, well, yeah, so what he was got, that? He got roasted. He said, we're great at it. it. We're great at it for it. And everybody annihilated him for it. And now since then, he hasn't thrown, I think, a single challenge flag. Situationally, you ha you have to there.
it was like a third down catch and Terry McLaurin clearly caught it off the turf. It was a huge play in the second quarter. It would have at least eliminated three points off the board. And in a close game like this, forget the Doug Kramer shit, forget all these points matter, throw a motherfucking flag. And the same way you said it, Pauly, you don't get bonus points for keeping all your timeouts. Throw it and see what the fuck happens. Uh, number five, Tyreek Stevenson being matched up at any point on Terry McLaurin. And I said this on the deep ball. You need to shadow Jalen Johnson on Ty- Terry McLaurin because there is no other receiver on that team. If that's the your team game just play, doesn't run that. And I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I can't it be stand your best it. man on your best man. They just play halves. Just like it the can safeties. be done. And I get that. It can be halves and it can be done against certain teams. You can do against Tennessee when Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins are basically the same guy at this point in their career. You can do it against other teams. You can do it. You can't do it against the Washington Commanders when their only offensive threat is Terry McLaurin. You need to just take it away, shut it down, be flexible. If there's no say, you need to be flexibility in your so, defensive scheme, this is more to support your point, yeah. Carl. You can find any fucking schmuck in the NFL who's a defensive coordinator who runs 4-3 and a modified version of Tampa 2 and fucking cover 2 man. It's not that different. My last two, this is going to be less, I guess, on Matt Eberflus if you want to. Um, I still say this one is huge. Doug Kramer getting the ball is still an Eberflus problem. It still is. He gets the veto rights. He can hear it come through the headset and say, whoa, 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 what the fuck are we doing? What the fuck are we doing? What the fuck are we doing? And he can literally veto that shit on third down in a crunch time fourth quarter with three timeouts, as Paulie has pointed out multiple times at this point. And Matt Eberflus has the ability and the absolute right. And if he did it and had the balls to do it and said, guys, guys, timeout, he'd be the fucking hero to it. But he did it. And my final point, fourth and one, this is probably the least on Matt Eberflus. It's a play that just pissed me off. The short side flare screen to DJ Moore on fourth and yeah. one at midfield. It, it pissed me off so fucking badly. It's a fucking flare screen one on one to the short side of the field. My thought. The on one that. where he got face masked and nobody said anything. Yep. Correct. Yep. He did and get DJ Moore masked. got up all pissed yep. off and none of the commentators yep. said anything. And that's fine. About it. And that's fine. That was it should have called... been a face mask. I'll take everyone I can get right now, right? Just because it does feel like we're supposed to be in a position where the window's opening. And at that point, I'm willing to accept luck. Um, I'm also a realist here. They kicked our ass for three quarters. Okay. And so, listen, it's nice for Caleb to be able to dr- make some clutch drives at the end. Um, however, it's kind of like a double-edged sword because now this thought exists in the back of these guys heads where we could go in there put in all our effort and this thing's still going we'll still mess it up you know what i mean whereas like if you do win that game then then it kind of just like it reinforces that positivity of hey put in every ounce of energy you have into this because it's all possible but instead that's what the the uh, commanders got right they're now moving forward with the idea that this team will fight to the end no matter what because look what we just did, right? So, it, it, it you know, a lot of people are like, can you bounce back from this, this, and that? You know, um, we've had – we've been going on the fire Matt Eberflus thing for like over a year now. So, it, 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 from my opinion, it, he, he's a good defensive coordinator. I always tend to credit the players more than I do the coaches, right? Um not saying that the coaches don't have impact or, or affect it. They do a lot, but I tend to just give more credit to the players. And so I, I don't think that you can't – I don't think that, like, Iberflus is irreplaceable. I think there's other guys that could come in here and get production out of this defensive talent that you have on the field. Um, he just seems very average to me. And so when it comes to a couple plays a game, when it comes to getting a challenge, when it comes to doing the right thing, I find that you're going to be on the wrong side – of that more often than you are on the right side of that. So um, I've said, Hey, there's an upgrade here to be made. He's not terrible. Right. But he's not great. And I'm not willing to crown him. And I guess his best quality is not letting the ship sink all the way to the bottom. Last year, after that Detroit collapse, I said, this team will not play as hard for this man again. And then the next week against the Vikings, they did. They went out and got four turnovers again and they continued to sit there. And so I said, I was wrong. Okay. So maybe he does have, you know, maybe he's good enough for these guys to 
believe, fight for him, this and that, great. But like, how many times are you going to do this with this kind of epic collapse before you give up? And I found it very interesting that these players were speaking up, and now all of a sudden, I don't know if you guys heard quotes recently, it's, oh, well, we need to keep things in-house. We need to keep things in-house. I think... Personally, and this is just speculation here. I don't know anything. I'm not reporting anything. I don't have any insight. It's just my brain working. I think they're upset. They can't yell back at the media, right? He's saying, I appreciate your questions. I appreciate your questions. Goes behind closed doors to the locker room. Goes, what the hell, guys? You're helping throw me under the bus here. Quit it. Stop it. And instead, he's taking his frustrations out on the players instead of owning it himself like he should. He should be the spearhead for this team. It should start with him, just like the quarterback. He that They're on the same level. They go out there and say, hey, it's us. It's us, and then whatever. You know what I mean? And Iberflus just refuses to do that. And so I think that's going to really bite him in the ass in the long run. So Iberflus did take accountability um, yesterday on Wednesday. T- took long enough. And to your point regarding the players, it was both DJ Moore and um, – the safety, Kevin Byard. They both had essentially threw him under the bus. So your point very well received and it's true. Yeah, I felt like he did it to get the monkey off his back. Okay, fine. It's my fault. Let's move on. We got another game. Yeah, like you, you didn't, PR training you didn't is, own yeah. it. You own it right in the moment when it's I'm the hardest here. when it's the hardest time to do so. You show that you're a damn leader and you go up there right after the damn game. You know what I mean? And you own it because you're you're the head coach. So when you look around the league, you got a guy like Doug Peterson, who won a Super Bowl in a, you know, in his three years later is fired from the Eagles, right? Three years like Nick Foles got Super Bowl MVP that year, his backup quarterback. So despite even losing your quarterback and being a v- very average coach, I think Iberflus is a better coach than Doug Peterson, right? He still has that Super Bowl on his resume. Whereas like you look at a guy like Andy Reid, it took him twenty years before he finally won a Super Bowl. And that's where at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, the players are the ones that have to get it done for you. It wasn't until you got Patrick Mahomes, but everybody knew you were a great coach. You know what I mean? It's just those things don't always go hand in hand. And so is it possible for Matt Eberflus to win with this team? Sure, of course. And I think that that's what the hope was that we were going to ride on, that we're going to have players that are talented enough to overcome having an average coach. You know what I mean? However, you know, that's coming to fruition a little bit. You saw Caleb Poli ever flew off the field. It's stuff like that. You know what I mean? Where it's like, man, that shouldn't be after leading a fourth quarter comeback, sitting down on the bench with 25 seconds to go, not expecting to play another play unless you go in overtime, right? Sit down, take a breath. What's the first thing you do? You have to go get your coach, pull him off the field from getting a penalty. Like that shouldn't be your concern at that point if you're Caleb but he's still you know his awareness is still there so um, I think that's a positive sign but like I said I'm not just going to sit here and pretend that there isn't an upgrade available at the head coaching position and I'm a cutthroat guy I think this is a cutthroat league and I'm willing to make tough decisions sometimes in order to make clear obvious upgrades and if Ben Johnson was available out there I don't know how you didn't pull the trigger I don't know Who's a clear-cut, obvious head coach that you'd want to go out and get to replace Iberflus? Like last offseason or this upcoming season? Going into this upcoming season because we can't go back into the past, unfortunately. So you can't answer that honestly because you don't know who's available yet. Um, last year, like so, I would have – I don't think Jim Harbaugh is the perfect coach. I would have taken him. Yeah, I would have. Yeah, I think I, that's I, an upgrade I would over have, I would have for sure taken Jim Harbaugh. He brings a better staff with him. You know what I mean? And so at least you're experienced enough in this league to have connections. Like, let's not forget, in in San Francisco, Harbaugh had Vic Fangio under him. You know what I mean? So, like, this, that's part of the deal here. Whereas we uh, don't have that with Heber Flus. He's an up-and-coming guy. So anybody who he gets is also up-and-coming. Like, Luke Getze was not an offensive coordinator. You know what I mean? You have to give these guys new opportunities. So it's like, uh, on one hand, I would like a guy with some experience. Man, if you could pull out, if you could, yeah, I would say Brian Dable is probably a better head coach over Flus. No. He's just in a no. bad he, he's situation over there. Yeah, I guess. But, I mean, they're really handicapped by their quarterback. It, it's the decision to keep Daniel Jones that really screwed him. 
I don't understand John's <laughs> comment though. He said you could have had Brian Dayball and Cliff Kingsbury. I think Cliff Kingsbury, if he's going to leave the Redskins, it's going to be a head coach. I do not want Cliff Kingsbury as a head coach. No, but I and wanted him as an offensive coordinator, and I felt the Bears that, were too That's afraid. debatable. I felt the in the Bears long were too run, I think it's going to gonna hurt move. the quarterback. I felt the Bears were too afraid to make that move because if you have a guy with head coaching experience as your offensive coordinator, and this happens, too, my what brother. what's happening now, then everybody's calling for Eberflus to step down and Kingsbury to take over. Whereas right now, we can't do that because there's nobody to take over. You're forced to ride it out with Eberflus. And I think that's more of a situation that they preferred. I choose to, you know, back off of the week to week thing and kind of take a look at the bigger picture. And so, sure, Greg Gabriel said what he said. And sure, the stats are and the records are whatever. You can, you can sit there and pick apart any argument like that period okay the chargers they're not in a strong division they're in the afc i mean i, I could list you multiple teams they, that are their than, losses but, are very very legitimate and anyone and who's saying that the cardinals sh- are a bad sure. team we're gonna see that what we'll, i'm we'll figure saying, that out though, real soon what i'm saying though is in the big picture i trust harbaugh way more than i trust deeper flus period you know what i mean and it's not about this week, like you ask me what I think is going to happen next week. I think we'll win. I think we'll win against the Patriots. We'll be feeling all giggly for the next two weeks. And then reality is going to sink in when we face some damn tough teams from this division. And it's time to perform and time to act again. And in the long run, I think you'll see these failures repeat. Listen, guys, you saw the statistic come out of all these probabilities and what the chances are of it happening four times, right? It's one in a million. We got a one in a million head coach, guys. Foster, before I answer your question, PJ, I just want to kind of answer some of your points a little bit because I feel like, you know, you're saying two different things at times. And it's like, okay, so one, we have to go through the growing pains with Caleb Williams. Of course. You're also saying that Matt Eberflus is learning on the job. So we also have to go through his growing pains at the same time. In, in After he's been a head coach multiple years now and had time to figure this out. So that's... Okay, then you're saying there is a chance to still get a lot of wins. Yes, 100%. I think your idea of what that chance is and my idea differ a little bit. You're probably a little bit higher with that percentage of a chance. I think I'm a little bit lower. But there's always a chance that you could still turn this thing around and you know overcome average coaching, right? And then you're going off and pointing out the improvements that the coaching could have had. And so... You know, you're saying don't fire. I'm not on the whole don't uh, fire everybody and this and that. Like, you're in a situation where you're not going to fire Eberflus right now. Who's going to replace him? You got nobody better, right? So you're you're handicapped into riding this thing out to the end of the year one way or another, whether it's good or bad or whatever. Bears won't fire head coaches during the middle of the season. You're riding this thing out with Matt Eberflus, right? Like, this is his last shot. It's do or die. Go ahead. But then we're noticing all these faults that you're making that, like you said, can he get better? Sure. How long? How much longer is it going to take him to get better? I don't know, and I don't. I don't really want to find out. So, in my opinion, I would much rather get a guy in here who is better, who has that stuff figured out, who won't like a head coach who will make less of those errors that he's making right now. And so, like I said, I'm just. I'm not saying that Matt Eberflus is the worst guy out there or whatever. But I'm, I'm also not saying that he's the greatest and he's irreplaceable. Mm-hmm. I think that there is definitely candidates out there that could come in here with a staff, still get production out of these players, and, you know, when it comes to what they're responsible for, make less errors and do a better job. Of course, there's worse ones out there, too, and we've all seen that. But I'm willing to take that risk and try and pair that up with Caleb Williams than I think to keep this thing going after this year, right? In fact, <laughs> I was I was all for it. At the beginning, like in the offseason, I kind of wanted to do this. I'd rather be a step ahead than a step behind. Um, and then Foster, was there growth? I mean, yes and 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 no. I mean, it, it's kind of sh- it kind of sucks. Is there growth? I think there's growth. I think there's growth every game, especially for a rookie quarterback that's only played so many games. And so you're gonna go through your ups and downs, you're gonna have your bad games to sit here and see him overcome all that and still show up in the clutch moments is very good. I have very little concern about Caleb Williams moving forward. Um, However, I wish it was reinforced, reinforced with the victory, reinforced with the prize. 
instead of reinforced with failure. That's where I feel like, I, I don't know, like it, that kind of sucks. You know what I mean? But the prize yeah, I think is the playoff, Paul. The, the, the prize is, is the trophy, Foster. Um, <laughs> Romeo Dobbs on the Packers did not specify why he missed a practice and it led to a, a, him getting suspended. Jair Alexander he on the Packers. did specify why. It, that's what led to a suspension. Jair Alexander, for uh, for his pregame toss antics, got suspended. The Patriots suspended Malcolm Butler for the Super Bowl. Why? Because, because the team's bigger than you, man. Vernon Davis is all I have to say. Vernon Davis. I don't want him. We can't we can't win with him. You guys remember Mike Singletary? It, Vernon Davis, he, he said that changed him around. He said it changed his whole life around that benching. Okay. And so it 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 has to happen. I like Tyreek as much as everybody else likes Tyreek. Uh, Foster, you said, like, do you hurt the whole team? I mean, I, I, it's it might just be necessary. It's just it's part I'm of the deal. I'm not trying to have him be like Gomer Pyle from Full Month jacket i don't want these guys beating him with soap in the middle of the night because they have to suffer for him but i don't think that's it i think what it is is setting expectations setting a tone for what is acceptable and what isn't and that's just not acceptable and it won't be repeated by you or anybody else on this team without consequences period first time around and so in my opinion it sucks it sucks that he did it, it you gotta you gotta do it man it, it's it's yeah. hard you got to do it. 